Brian Post here. Welcome to the November Inner Circle Call. This is National Adoption Month. I um, think most of you are probably aware of that. Some of you may not be. And it's, it's, it's been a very interesting month for me, um, particularly as far as the journal is concerned. The journal is actually not out and off to you yet. I have been having a very interesting adoption month process with this journal, and, and I'm going to been kind of you know waiting waiting to um, to have my my creative flow unleashed for this month, but there are a lot of things that have happened in my life as far as my own adoption um, goes that I'll be sharing with you guys this month in the journal um, that I think also kind of plays into that. So I'll be looking forward to sharing that with you. But as I said, I have a very special guest that's going to be joining us for the first half of our call. Miss Jeanette Yaffe from California is a marriage and family therapist, and she is also a psychotherapist who specializes in adoption and foster care. Now, what makes Jeanette so very unique and wonderful is that she's also a foster adopt child herself, and she has a, a thriving private practice in West Los Angeles. And Jeanette, I get some of her um, emails. I'm on her her email list, and she puts on the the most phenomenal little workshops and trainings for the people in the California area. Really, people from from whoever wants to come in. But one of her most recent ones that prompted me to reach out to her is that she was having a roundtable discussion with adoptees and, and people who have been in foster care mm. stuff that that was really cool. And I said, hey, i got to get this lady with all this passion and all this fire on our call to talk to our inner circle. So, Jeanette, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you, Brian. I'm so happy to be here and part of your inner circle call. I well, really we, am. I'm just we're extremely thrilled. honored, extremely <laughs> honored. Why don't we start off, Jeanette, by you telling us about yourself who you are, how you got here, what you do. Let's just talk. Okay, and we have how many minutes? <laughs> okay. Uh, you take your time. You, we, we'll, <laughs> take we'll, my... make, we'll make all the time available we need. Oh, thank you. Um, well, let me just say that um, I'm originally from New York. I currently live in Los Angeles, and I was um, I lived with my birth family for 15 months, and then my mother experienced, my birth mother experienced some mental health issues, and then I ended up going into foster placement. Um, I found out later, after reuniting with her, uh, gosh, five years ago, very recent, that um, she was trying to reunify with me. Uh, but there were a lot of issues at the time, and I was supposed to go live with family members who were in Argentina because my birth mother is native Argentinian. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I've learned a lot of new information as an adult and only recently, five years ago. Wow. So, um, so at 15 months, I went into foster care in New York, and I later learned as well that I had a biological, full biological brother with the same father. And we met... Um, when I was after we both graduated high school, he had searched for me for four years, and just before this phone call, I computed that my birth mother was carrying him for the eight months that I was that I, I remained with her. So I had knowledge, which I didn't know, that there was a baby on the way. Yeah. So, you know, like these early experiences, and I was only 15 months when I separated from her, but I was able to see that her belly was growing, that she was carrying a second child, and then I was to be separated from her. So I, it, just makes me, it just makes me think about the grief and loss issue in and of that because when I went into foster care at 15 months, I stayed in foster care with the same family until the age of seven and a half. And people always ask me, why were you in foster care for so long? And at that time, um, there was discussion. And, you know, in the 70s, kids were getting lost in the system. And there were 
so there was such an overflux of children going into foster care that I almost have a feeling <clears throat> that I was one of them because I rarely saw my social worker. I didn't really understand. I thought they were my forever family, my permanent family, but they weren't. And it wasn't until I was in first grade when I put my name on my desk and I wrote my foster name and the teacher had to correct me and tell me, oh, that's that's not your name, Jeanette. Your name is your birth name. And it was the oh, first wow. time I'd ever seen my birth name. I'd ever had an understanding of, oh, this is not my family. This is my foster family. So it was really confusing for me. Oh. And that was first grade. Previous to that, um, when I was five, the social worker came to the house and told me that you are going to meet your brother. And I had never known at that point consciously, you know, as you know with the memory, I didn't know consciously that I had a brother. So she was telling me, you have a brother, and you're both going to go on a long plane ride to Argentina to go live with a family relative, my birth mother's sister and so here I was I'm five years old getting all this information and I remember all that I wanted to do was go outside and play because first of all it was overwhelming and second of all I, I, I could not comprehend what she was telling me it was just really confusing and then a few weeks later I ended up meeting my brother for the first time and he's 13 months younger than I am and We met, and it was one of the scariest moments in my life because I had seen a sibling, and I never had the experience of being reflected so clearly and mirrored because we looked identical. Oh, my gosh. And so here I was, five years old. We ended up going out to Burger King, and we had passports made, which I just got my hands on um, less than five years ago. And the the look on my face, I mean, talk about dissociation. You know, photo a photo from that time period was rare for me. I didn't have any baby photos of myself, um, nothing. And my, my foster family did not take photos. Um, so I basically came into the world, you know, as a seven-year-old girl. Um, but this photo of me, this passport, I just look so dissociated, shut off emotionally and really overwhelmed and it's hard for me to look at that photo because I I can read into it now and understand it now as an adult what I was experiencing but at that time it, it was it was really overwhelming and to add to that we never went to Argentina um my I never saw my brother again I ended up going having a few visits with different families to they were to consider uh, adoption for me because at that time my foster family was just that a foster family and it wasn't on the table foster adoption like it is today Um, but looking back also and I'm still in contact with that foster family they were an older couple they weren't um, able to care for such a young child at that time so they were pretty much ready to also find a family for me as well Um, so I never saw my biological brother again. Uh, the talk of going oh, to Argentina, wow. I never heard about again, and it was never discussed. And here I am, seven and a half. I am a. I go to a family, a potential adoptive family, and uh, my adoptive father has told me many times when we first met you, I, I realized here was a child with who was already a person. I had so much experience behind me that he had no idea about and that was scary for him to you know take in a seven and a half year old and not know any of the experiences that I had experienced and just know that he had to just be there for me um, and be of support and uh, I think the reason why I'm a therapist today is because I so desperately needed mental health services as a young child and I see so many kids today that just really need to be heard and seen 
all that grief and loss and those overwhelming feelings just need to be recognized by someone who gets it. As you know, Brian, you know, they really need a therapist who understands the attachment needs, the sense of safety, the security, um, and really understand and how to be with all these overwhelming feelings and not be overwhelmed and dysregulated yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really my goal in helping parents and families and children really help each other see and hear each other so that attachment can thrive. Um, so that's my story. And just five years ago, I, we, my brother and I took that plane ride to Argentina and we met our birth mother for the first time. And it was an incredible and cathartic experience for me. Um, I had a lot of feelings. My birth mother did not know that I was placed in foster care for so long. And my, my brother had just moved to, gone into one family. He was also separated from my birth mother at nine months old. She, she had another psychotic episode at that time. And then he went into foster care, and he stayed with the same family. So for my brother and I, we had two different experiences. He had more consistency than I did. Unless, you know, I wouldn't, I don't want to compare grief and loss, Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely had more rage, um, more anger towards my birth mother because I, I suffered more. I had more challenges than my brother did where he was able to really attach to his, um, adoptive family where I had a lot of issues because I was an older child and I didn't get the intervention I needed which was mental health, attachment-focused family work. Um, It wasn't until I was 13 that um, my parents started to really see that I was really challenged emotionally because uh, my, my adoptive family, first they took in me, they adopted me, and then they adopted my brother uh, probably about three years later uh, as an infant. He was a drug-exposed baby. Um, he came to live with us. We adopted him, and then we took in a third child, and she lived with us for one year. And what happened was in that one year that she came to live with us, I experienced her having visits with her birth family. I was about hmm, probably 11 or 12 at the time, and she came to live with us, and there was reunification on the table for her. So here I was experiencing a one-year-old being able to have visits with her birth family. I was then questioning, is my birth mother going to come and get me? Where's my birth mother? I started having all these questions about my own story. And then this, this baby was reunified with her birth mother. And that pretty much triggered my whole trauma, all my trauma. I was acting out all over the place. I was running away a lot and not listening to my parents and they weren't understanding my grief and loss and yeah but they they wouldn't have had any idea as to what caused that yeah Yeah. and they just saw it as you know disrespectful defiant and i got the typical you know go in the corner sitting on the steps getting my mouth washed out with soap which for me And I've talked to my adoptive mom about it today, which for me only reinforced my sense of shame Mm. that, see, I'm just not good enough. I'm just, I'm all wrong. And it just, and it pains me today because I I still feel that part of myself that's, it never goes away. Mm -hmm. It's how you manage it. And I teach, and when I work with teenagers, I talk about that. I say, you know what? This is, you know, the term, the lifelong process. We're always going to have these feelings. It's what we do with it that matters because we can't fix them. They, we can't make them go away. They're going to be there, and they're going to come up at the most surprising and alarming times. And it's listening to them, acknowledging them, and loving those parts of ourselves. And I've really learned to do that and I think with the work that I do, I'm so passionate, as you see, um, you know, creating events like the Resilient Spirit. Really, it helps me to reinforce, you know what, I've been through a lot, and I'm resilient, 
and I'm going to be a mentor, and I'm going to give back and help children and adults and adult adoptees and children, former foster youth, recognize the resilient spirit in them because when we can have hope, it can get us out of that despair. Mm. And that's truly my goal. Um, and I use myself a lot as the model. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because I feel like if, if I'm not doing the work, then if I don't go far within myself, then the families and children that come into my office are not going to go far within themselves. So I need to do the work, too. And I feel like that's a responsibility I have in coming so far in my life. Like, I always feel that I was lucky because looking back, I did not endure physical abuse. I mean, there was some, but it wasn't pervasive. It wasn't on a daily basis. I did not experience sexual abuse. And, you know, my I had another through our home who did experience sexual abuse. And it's been very difficult for her to feel safe and secure in the world. And I do feel like I'm lucky because the family that adopted me at seven and a half, I also learned as an adult that they were offered an infant. And then they got the call about me. And she was still deciding whether to take the infant. And then they called, the agency called my family, my adoptive family, about me, well, you know, we have a seven-and-a-half-year-old girl. She needs a home. Would you also consider this child? And my parents really had to think, you know, are we prepared to take in a girl of, who's seven-and-a-half? And God bless them, they did. And thank God, because I don't know where I would be right now. I truly do not know. And had they said, no, we'll take the infant, I don't think I'd be as strong as I am today because they did give me a lot. And they gave me an education. They were good enough parents. And I feel like the the strengths that I received being adopted at that age um, have only enforced my work today. And I'm always um, encouraging parents, prospective adoptive families to consider that adopting an older child because I, I feel like I am a poster child for that older child. Mm. And there's a fear that they're going to turn out, you know, something's going to go wrong and they're not, you know, they're going to end up in juvenile or, or whatever, the fear of what's going to happen if, if I adopt an older child. But really, I am a poster child. These kids need us and they need someone to be that stable attachment figure who's there with them in and out through thick and thin. And my parents did that for me. Mm-hmm. And and I had mentioned earlier that when the, um, the one-year-old who lived with us was reunified with her birth mother, uh, it, you know, triggered all my uh, um, state memories. And then I started acting out all over the place and I, my mother, you know, she was very scared for me that I would keep sneaking out. So she said, you're going to sleep next to me on the floor next to me so I know where you are. And what ended up happening was I was sleeping on the floor and I was in a sleeping bag. And I remember just looking at like garbage on the floor, you know, it was right next to my parents' bed and I'm 12 years old and I'm looking at the garbage and I just, I identified with garbage, and I felt like I am just a piece of garbage. And it just struck me at that moment, nobody wants me. And my parents were just trying to enforce some structure, some limit setting, keeping me safe. Here I was sneaking out of the house. But yet for me, it was demeaning. It was shame. It was so shameful for me, and I tried to kill myself. And um, I wrote my girlfriend a letter, and and I say this story because it's important for parents to understand the shame. And I, I talk a lot about that, the helplessness, the shame that a child feels, um, because if we don't understand that, 
then anything that we do will not be effective. That a child really needs to be heard, that shame part of themselves. And a lot of my interventions really focus on that part of the child's inner world. Um, Because shame, when a child has shame, they do feel, I am just all bad, I'm all nothing, I'm not good enough. And it was at that point where I just said, you know, even this family can't see the good in me. I, I'm worthless. And eventually, thank God, my girlfriend, who I wrote a letter to, um, told her mother, and they caught me in time. I had taken some, I don't know, some aspirins or something. And they caught me in time, and it didn't happen. But still, I went to see a psychiatrist, and... Um, At that time, he recommended that she needs therapy. Mm -hmm. And it was at the age of 13 that I started therapy. And I haven't stopped since. And I'm I'm a grown adult, Mm -hmm. and I still need therapy because issues still come up for me. And I am a new parent now, and I have a 4-year-old. So his cries trigger my own inner cries, my own memories of my own loss and my own grief. And I acknowledge it as an adult, and um, and it only enriches my life more because then I really understand the lifelong process that a child who's been through foster care goes through. And it's interesting because I feel like I'm on two ends of the spectrum. Here I am, I was adopted, and then I was also in foster care, so... I feel an equal amount of love for both types of children. Sure. And I I work um, with an organization that mentors foster youth and children who are aging out of the system at age 18 who have nobody, who are not adopted. And I just feel so strongly for these kids because that could have been me. And, again, I just really encourage families to consider adopting an older child and when you have you know your inner circle when you have the education and the resources you can do it and the support and so that's my story well Um, i think i think it's (laughs) that's a lot yeah and it's it's so powerful because you you had the the suicide attempt in reaction to what was seemingly a, a nothing as far as the parents were concerned. Right. I mean, it, you know, it was their kind of their approach to to um, to addressing you regarding the behaviors and things of that nature, you know, was one thing. But to you, that said something completely different. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that I that's, that's sometimes that's hard for us to grasp as parents. Yeah how our very, um, and there's a word I'm, I'm looking for, benign, our very benign everyday communication coming from us can be received by our child as just tremendous and, and impactful. Yes, yes. And, and for me, I, I just, and I realized at that point, because when I went into therapy, that I literally felt, and it it almost was like a gift that I that that happened because it really helped me understand that I am worthy. But mm-hmm. I really identified with this, you know, this ball of paper that was in a ball that was just thrown out and missed missed the garbage pail. But that was me. Mm. That is how I saw myself. And wow, you know that. And I always ask kids to, when they come into my office, to give me a, a symbol or something that they that they identify with that is them, because it's so telling, you know. And I'll gi- I'll show them the example, and I'll give them my own example from my own life. You know, I thought I was a ripped up piece of paper. I thought I was a piece of garbage. Mm-hmm. You know, what's your symbol? What, how are you feeling? What does it look like to you so children can get a perspective? Because a lot of kids, especially in this population, um, work a lot in fantasy. They live in that world. Yeah. And so I help them really explore through objects and symbols, um, 
because there's a lot of talk, a lot of times there's a lot of, a big theme about this big black hole with kids, and we'll draw this big black hole, which really is that primal wound, that mm-hmm. abyss of just utter despair and helplessness that is so scary to go into because you have to feel it. And we'll draw this big black hole, and sometimes we all go in it, even the parents will all go in the big black hole and see what it feels like and experience it together. So we, the child feels hurt, feels acknowledged. They're not alone in the pain. And really that's my goal because I so badly wanted my parents to be with me in my pain. I would say all the, I would cry all the time and my mother would say, my adoptive mom would say, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Mm-hmm. And you know what I needed her to say? Mm. I feel sorry for you. I wanted her to feel sorry for me. And I, I've talked to her about this as an adult, and she was able to apologize to me. Yeah. And I was so grateful. I just needed you to say, you know, just let me cry and go, honey, come here. Let me hold you. I can see how sorry you feel. And I'm so sorry you feel so sorry. Mm. And really, that's what I help parents understand, to have compassion for that child's, you know, have empathy for that child's uh, just uh, despair and and grief and loss. And that child will attach. It's Mm. what they need. They'll soak it up like a sponge. That Uh, That grief from the perspective of the parent is so hard, Jeanette, yeah, because, it is. because we don't know, as, as, especially as adopted parents or foster parents, we don't, know, we don't even know that there's grief there. And, and let right. me read, I want to read a quote, because I want you to talk more about that. Um, but this comes from um, Peter Levine, his, his, his book, Trauma Through a Child's Eyes. Mm-hmm. It says, so often, he says, so often people remark, but she was only an infant when it happened, or a good thing the car crash happened before he was born, implying that this diminished or eliminate that this diminished or eliminated any impact. Such statements reveal a widespread misunderstanding about the nature of trauma. What happens from the fetal period until two years of age creates the blueprint that influences every system in the body from immunity to the expression and regulation of emotion, to nervous system resilience, communication, intelligence, and self-regulatory mechanisms for such basics as body temperature and hormone production. Wow. That's just huge. That is huge. And and to have to have any of those lost experiences and your symbolism of being being a piece of trash just thrown out, I mean, that's just so so enormous just thinking about being being placed for adoption or put into foster care you know and and having even having your mother pregnant with your brother while you were were still with her yeah you know there's even more symbolism with that and, and that to think about how we no matter how young we are we carry that that memory those imprints and that there's grief there that and this is as far as I'm concerned, this is relatively un, untouched and unacknowledged in the adoption field. Mm-hmm. We we just I mean we are so far off the mark from really understanding loss, grief, and loss for infants and for adopted children and for foster children and what that means for the adults in their lives and how to honor that for them. Yeah, yeah. and that it's a lifelong process. Yes, it is. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm a grown woman, and Father's Day was when in May. I I have tried to contact my birth father. I know where he is. He won't have contact with me. And it uh, on a on an adult level, mm-hmm. I can understand. Oh, he has his limitations. He's not ready. But as on that infantile level, like Peter Levine talks about, I have a body memory of being with him. I was with him for 15 months. Why won't he see me? And on Father's Day, I had a complete grief reaction. I, I was so emotional. I'm thinking, what, what's 
what's happening to me? Mm. And I put two and two together. I said, oh, my God, this is, this is a grief reaction that I'm yes. having right now. And I'm an adult. <laughs> and I'm missing my father, who I had an attachment with. Absolutely. And, and I had three fathers. I had a foster father who I had an attachment with, and I have my adoptive father. And I, I knew exactly who I was crying for. And it was just incredible to me. And that just happened this year. Mm. So, and I am actually in the process of developing a uh, training for adult adoptees and uh, uh, children who have former foster youth on grief and loss, how to work through our grief and loss as adults. Yeah, and that's, see, and that's a whole, you, that's you bring a, that perspective to the table as well for adults. Who, who yeah. or uh, adoptees as well. I mean, that's that's another. I mean, one of my close friends is Rhonda Rorta, and she's she just has written laboriously ar- around transracial adoption, and it deals with a lot of adult adoptees and the challenges that they have. Mm-hmm. But it, it's such there's such a hole, there's such a gap in the field yeah. around adult adoptees. So you bring that that also. So I'm sure your workshops will be very valuable. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and I just wanted to touch on another piece, and that is, you know, the the I wrote an article, and it's on journeytome.com. And, and that's also that article is also going to be in this upcoming edition of the journal. Oh, okay, great. Absolutely. It's called Hold On to My Feelings. And that helps families, you know, understand how to connect to the grief and loss and be there in that abyss, that primal wound. And the, I always talk about the primal wound. If callers don't know, it's the book by Nancy Verrier where she talks about that part of the child, that the part of their psyche that is just so primal and there's it's so there's such an abyss of feelings it's like a big well that is just so scary for an adopted person or even former foster youth to go into because they have to feel the loss um and it's interesting because i'm a new mom i I have a four-year-old and as he was attaching to me i all my grief was I, i was feeling very sad because the more I saw he needed me the more I saw how much I needed my birth mom and how much oh my god I I have a six month old and look at how much he's attached to me Mm. and I had this attachment and I left at 15 months I, I just it just struck me and how much children do want to attach and do need to attach and need that security and and if they don't have it they're just they're in that abyss they're just so alone and i was lucky to have that attachment and then lose it which was not lucky but i was able to have that but it it actually it helped me understand much more on a deeper level how attachment is formed and how much we as human beings need it um, to feel what, safe and secure in the world. What do what do parents need to listen for when it comes to being in tune with their child's grief? Good question. You know, and that reminds me, when a child says, "I'm stupid." You know, when they're doing their homework, I, I'm stupid, and a parent comes in and says, oh, no, you're not stupid. That's a clue that he's having a negative sense of his, himself, and that's part of the shame and that there's something wrong with me. That a parent coming in and, see, and hearing a child saying, I'm stupid, it's, oh, there's a part of you that feels like you're stupid, tell me about that. Or, wow, I hear you think you're stupid. Wow, I don't experience you as stupid. I experience you as trying real hard to do this math homework. But you're experiencing yourself as stupid. It's acknowledging 
the, the negative self-comment remarks that come out a lot. And that's just one point. But I think if a child's crying a lot, if a child's quiet, really quiet, I tend to be scared that they're harboring a lot of feelings and I, I then, you know, help the parent connect with the child so the child doesn't feel ashamed about these feelings but to join with them in that moment and really create that safe space so the child is able to express their feelings and like the intervention I do with ripping of the telephone book. Mm-hmm. Um, but am I answering your question? Um, yes. You know, crying, pervasive crying, and I did that a lot. If a, ch- if a parent corrects a child and the child feels um, badly about themselves from being corrected, then they're feeling there could be a sense that the child feels bad about themselves. Again, it's that shame, because pretty much grief and loss with adoption, there's a lot of shame around it. Mm -hmm. because kids don't want to express this part of themselves. Why? And this this is the biggest question, and I have the answer. It's like, why won't these kids share this part of themselves? Because if I share it with you, will you abandon me psychologically and literally? Mm -hmm. There are two parts there. Will you just not be here with me, or will you not be here with me and then send me away? And give me away to another family. I mean, I have, I have eight, nine, ten-year-olds coming to my office who've been in their adoptive families for years, for most of their life. They're still questioning, are you going to give me away? I mean, it's, 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 it's that imprint. Right. I was given away at birth. It's going to happen again. And the grief in that is so scary. And it's always lurking. And so children will harbor feelings they won't share. And it and if a parent is able to be that therapeutic parent and create that safe place and openness and talk about adoption and let the child know I'm here to listen, I'm not here to fix, I'm not here to give advice, I'm not here to take away your pain, I'm just here to be and join with your pain, and I'm not going to run away. And just hearing those words, would just be a godsend for a child, for a parent to say, you know what, I'm here to listen. And if you have feelings about your birth family, about being adopted, I'm right here, and I'm not going to run away, and I'm not going to let go of you. I'm going to be right here, Mm, and you're safe with me. And, you know, the tone in my voice, the empathy is so important, that a parent really needs to feel that, because kids will know when a, an authentic, kids will know when a parent when a parent is being authentic or just saying some lines. Right. Kids know. Kids are smart, and I have teenagers who come in my office. They're watching everything I do and say, and I have to dig deep within myself a lot and go, what can I say right now that's authentic within myself, so that this child understands. I do care about you. And if if I need to dig so deep within myself because I can't find something, I can't feel it right now, I'm going to find something. And that's about connection. You know, a lot of times there's talk about children going to school and the parent, the, the teacher not connecting with the child. And I always encourage the teacher, find something about that child that you, you just love. And once that child recognizes that you are connected to them, they will do better in the classroom. They will have a sense of connection and attachment. They'll be recognized by you in an individual way. Um, So it's really going within yourself. You know, as a clinician, as a, a parent, anyone working with these kids, really being authentic is very important in letting them know, I, I want to be here with you and your feelings. And I'm so sorry you have these feelings, and I'm here with you. 
um, and really focusing on the vulnerability. That's an important piece. Um, you know, just focusing on how hard it must be to not be able to put into words all these feelings. Because I think a lot of the time, too, we, we put pressure on, you know, tell me how you're feeling, and then, then they don't have the words. And then we feel helpless in that moment, like, oh, I'm not being here with my child's feelings. But all you can say is, you know, I see how hard it is to find the right words. Right. It must be so hard. And, and let's just be here with the not right words. Mm. You know, just meeting the child right there, it's so hard, and I, I feel that. And thats that takes practice, and that's why this intervention that I created, Hold On to My Feelings, really gives you that practice. How do I just stay connected to what's happening in front of me? Now, this this um, article that I'm going to run of this intervention in this much journal, this is this is one of many interventions that come from a book you've written, right? Yes. And tell us about that book, and also give us your website. Give tell us your website. Okay, it's www.yoff, and my name is Yoff. It's Y O F F E, two F like Frank E Therapy dot com. So it's Yoff like cough. Okay. So Yofftherapy dot com. And uh, on my products page, I have a manual. It's called Groundbreaking Interventions, and it's working with traumatized children in foster care and adoption. And it's 30 interventions that I developed for a therapist, social workers, parents to heal anything from anxiety, fear, worry, stress, anger, aggressivity, frustration, poor impulse control, grief, loss, depression. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I target these specific issues with each intervention. And, you know, I developed these because I so much thought, you know, I'm going to all these this, these um, trainings on theory, but what do I do? Mm-hmm. And I just started to dig deep within myself, well, what did I need as a kid? What did I need? Cool. And I developed my first intervention called the Anger Bag, and I needed help. I needed some coping skills. I needed to understand that there is a container for this anger. There, there, I can do something with this anger. I don't have to feel so helpless in it. And so I created this intervention called the anger bag because, I, you know, I get calls like at, you know, 8 o'clock at night, my child's banging his head against the wall, and the parent was feeling helpless too. I don't know what to do. So I created this bag for the parent and the, for the parent to have accessible for the child to notice when a child's becoming dysregulated, when they're becoming irritable, and offer them a coping skill in that moment. And it's you know they pick one of the 16 interventions. Usually I limit it to three, so it's not so overwhelming. We choose three, and then the parent offers it to the child. This is created together with the parent and it gets children excited and this is the strangest thing but I get kids excited about expressing their feelings which is what we want so that they feel effective Mm. and that builds self-esteem that builds resiliency I know what to do when I have these big big feelings they have knowledge I mean knowledge is key and you know so much of the time uh, helping these kids develop self-esteem comes from educating them, giving them resources so that they can do it on their own, so that they have it at their disposal, and helping them do it um, and being a support to them. So I really, um, you know, that's one intervention of 30. And um, and some people call me the bag lady because when I started the anger bag, I then developed three more bags. <laughs> <laughs> the stress bag, the sad bag, and um, the out of control bag, and they have different fun things for kids to do to apply their their feelings uh, with. And and you talk about all of these in your in the book, groundbreaking in the book. intervention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know it helps parents too. They they don't feel so helpless. They're like, wow, I I have something to offer my child 
in the moment, and I don't feel so helpless. So it, it, in a way, it helps regulate the parents, too. Cool. It, and a bag serves as a container, a containment, because feelings are messy, and they need containment. So that's where that one developed from, and I could talk about the rest, and that we'd be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> and that's but it's that, exciting. That's at Yoffe, Y-O-F-F-E, Therapy, Dot com. Dot com. And for your inner, inner circle members, on my website, I think it's 35 I'd be more than happy to give a $10 discount. Cool. And if they could just email me and say, you know, I heard you on inner circle call, and then I'll send them an invoice because it all goes through PayPal, and then they could just pay the $25 plus shipping and handling. Great. What's your email address? Jeanette. So my first name, J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E, at yofftherapy.com. Yofftherapy, Y-O-F-F-E, therapy.com. Cool. So at yofftherapy, at at yofftherapy.com, you can get Jeanette's groundbreaking interventions book, 30 Interventions, for uh, specific problems, behavioral issues, and strategies. It's 35 on the website. She's offering it to Inner Circle members for 25 You just email her at Jeanette at YaffeTherapy.com, and she'll send you the invoice. Correct. That's excellent. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And, and we have gone over the time that you had allotted me, and so I apologize, (laughs) but I am very appreciative and thankful. Um, Again, I want to say you're doing phenomenal work, and we would be honored to have any of your your written contributions to include in the Inner Circle Journal at any time. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So keep up the great work, and and, um, we appreciate your time very much. Thank you, Brian. I'm happy to be here. All right, you bet. All right, gang. Um, hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Jeanette. I actually had some questions that were emailed in, um, and I want to talk about those before we run out of time. And let's see. And Jeanette, are you going to stay? Are you with us still? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Good. You can hang out with us as long as you'd okay. like. Actually, I have a question. Um, since you're going to hang out with us. Um, I might get your your insight and input on from a, a grief standpoint. It comes from a mom, Kathy. She says she just had a surgery. She said it was weird because after the surgery, the girls wanted to see the cast that she had on. These are she has three adopted children. She and her husband. Um, they're teenagers, young teenagers. <laughs> they didn't ask anything else. Angela even almost kicked my leg. Parentheses deliberately question mark when she got mad at me about something at bedtime last night. Also this morning, none of them asked how my leg was feeling. This afternoon, Johnny asked how I was doing, but the girls didn't. Is it normal for kids to act like they don't care? Do they think they? Do you think they are afraid of the fact that mom had surgery, or do they feel a bit perturbed that I can't do everything right now that I normally do? Dad has had two surgeries since their adoption. This is my first ever. Uh, this is not a huge question, just more of, a, more of a curiosity. What's your thought about that? Well, um, the fact that they're not asking questions just kind of makes me think that they're scared to ask questions because it could be triggering their grief and loss. Could my mom, could I lose my mom? And to even ask the question, you know, are you feeling okay, mom? It, there's a sense of I could can I lose you, mom? Mm. You know they're afraid of the answer, mm-hmm. so it it makes sense that they might be scared to ask questions. I, I think it comes down to reassuring. I mean, any time a parent has an operation or surgery, it is going to trigger. I I could lose this person, and so children need a lot of reassurance that you're going to be there. You're going to heal. I may be in bed for a few days, but letting them know the whole process and preparing them and reassuring them that they are not going to lose you to this surgery um, is really important. Does that make sense? 
that makes perfect sense. And the the reality is, is they may be young teenagers, but this is not about their teenage brain. This is not no. about their their chronological development. This is this fear of loss. And John Bowlby says the threat of loss is equal to loss itself. And so, at a at a brainstem level, at an emotional brain level. This can send them right back to being, you know, one and two years old and, and abandoned in an orphanage. And there can be all kinds of anxiety that gets generated by a parent, an adoptive parent having surgery. Um, yeah, yes. And I'm curious about their interpretation of why they're adopted because a lot, when I was growing up, I thought that my mom was really, 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 really sick. And... So anytime somebody got sick, of course, I would think, uh-oh, I'm going to leave again. Yeah. So I don't know what their story is. It could be triggering their own understanding of their Maybe they think their mother was sick. I, I don't know what the story is, um, but that's a piece, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Excellent. And I, I think it is definitely we, we have to keep in mind that these are still children, and children don't always know how to ask questions. They don't know what's appropriate to ask, they don't know how to ask, and even if they do care and are concerned, they don't always know how to go about broaching the situation, especially if it could be potentially threatening. They yeah. they may be afraid of what they might hear. Yes, yes. So and, I'm, and there's just one little piece, and that is if a child's experiencing pervasive shame, they don't have guilt because guilt is developed after shame. So guilt is when someone can understand another person's experience. Oh, interesting. So if 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 they're in pervasive shame, they're in that egocentric brain. They're just in their own experience. But when a child does not experience guilt readily when they do something wrong, then they are high, then they don't measure high on levels of empathy. Mhm. And that's been science, that's been proven. Children, individuals who are rated high on measures of shame, are rated low on measures of empathy for others. Wow, I think that um, Kathy could definitely relate to what you're saying. And for me, what that what that also indicates is that a child, on an internal level, still experiences a lot of survival anxiety. Mm-hmm. and has a tendency to shut down and withdraw, mm-hmm. um, which is so common and pervasive with the shame dynamic. Mm-hmm. So when you're in survival, you can't really demonstrate empathy for someone else. No, you cannot. And so it's really important to be sensitive to that dynamic if we're experiencing that with our kids. Mm-hmm. Now, I had a general question here also, um, and feel free to, to comment as well. It says, Dear Brian, I would be interested to know what are your thoughts regarding bullies? What will you do if your child will be bullied at school? What will be the measures you will take, ask the school to do, deal with your child? And what will you suggest on how to deal with the bullier? What do you think it should be what do you think should be in place at school? Um, now schools apply zero tolerance, which I don't believe the kids can learn anything from by that fact, but they will be expelled. Um so that's that's an interesting question, Fanny, and I, I appreciate you um, to bringing that up. It's interesting also that bullying has become so much more common these days. Um, just currently, we seem to be talking a lot more about bullying in schools, and I've had a couple of schools actually um, consult with me lately about bullying in schools, and so I don't know what's going on in in our universal energy that's causing more stress for this to start to to come about it could be that we're approaching the holidays and holidays naturally become stressed children's windows of tolerance are getting smaller who knows but um i my actually my oldest daughter who's now 15 she she did experience it, experience a little bullying um initially when she was about 10 years old and I don't think it lasted very long, and it was not an issue that really had a had too great of an effect on her because she's always been pretty um, pretty independent minded. So I haven't really had a lot of of specific experience as far as my own kids are concerned. 
But what I always suggest to schools, and it's actually quite simple, is that once the child or the group of children who are doing the bullying can be identified, it is the responsibility of the school to create enough regulation for those children and enough understanding for those children, those children who are actually doing the bullying, that they are no longer that they can no longer be in that emotional place to feel threatened enough to need to bully. And so one of my specific suggestions is once you identify the bully, the bulliers, whoever they are, they get assigned to an adult in the school. And they get assigned to spend time with that adult, to be mentored by that adult. They do their classroom assignments with that with that and this is usually a teacher. They have lunch with this teacher. They are really encouraged to be in relationship with this with this teacher. Really the teacher takes complete responsibility. And when a school is willing to do that, I call that revolutionary bully busting. When a school is willing to do that, bullying doesn't last very long. It doesn't even the child who's being bullied does not need to be brought out as the cause of the intervention because that's just another dynamic, another reason, another experience for the child to be shamed by. The reality becomes it's not the child who's being bullied who is the only one being affected and impacted. It's the child who's actually doing the bullying who's obviously crying out for help and in need of more regulation in the environment because that child feels threatened. So one of my most direct approaches is to have the school and the adults immediately step up, take responsibility. I've had that happen in two schools with some pretty dramatic um, results by being able to take that approach. So that's like probably the most simple and the most direct, efficient way that I work with schools to approach bullying. Um, as a parent, you take on the school. You don't want to even view it as taking on. You want to view it as going in partnership with the school. You want to talk to the special education director. You want to say, this is my concern. You know, my child is reporting that there's some bullying going on, and these are the kids that he says that, that are being involved. And I'd really appreciate it if you could talk to him or if we could come and talk to you together so we can try to figure this situation out. And I think I'm even going to keep him out of school for a day until there's an opportunity for these kids to be, to be identified and to be addressed. And then what I might also encourage is that your, your child be assigned a mentor or be assigned an aide or a shadow for a period of time, not someone to walk beside him all the time or to hold his hand, but someone just to be there and to be more observant of his immediate environment. So that's also very important. And then when we start thinking about children with emotional challenges, which a lot of our children do have emotional challenges, they're not always able to relate socially and emotionally as effective with kids their own age as a lot of the other kids are able to, and so they can easily become targets. And if that's the case, I have, I have you know, I've read about Bruce Perry going into schools and talking to the classroom about some of the challenges a certain child may have just based on their history and their brain development and their early experiences and how that can create challenges in their abilities to relate, to help create more understanding amongst the other students. You know, to have the school counselor give an, edu give, give an educational discussion on the effects of trauma, the effects of, of loss and abandonment and things of that nature, to help foster more understanding amongst the kids as opposed to a lack of understanding. So those are some like some immediate ideas that I had and, and have oftentimes and share in regards to bullying. Jeanette, is there anything you want to offer there? Well, there's a show on MTV called If You Really Knew Me. Have you seen it? I haven't. And it's about these kids who get together and they have uh, an adult run the group and they really, and it's it's kind of like a rap group where the kids, can share parts of themselves that maybe they're afraid to share with someone else, and it's called If You Really Knew Me. And maybe there's some form of a support group that can be developed where there's a group, like a rap type of group, where these kids are asked to be a part of, and they have these groups throughout the school, throughout the grades, cool. where they 
where it's it's a mental health. I mean, it's not run by, say, a therapist, but it could be run by someone who understands the need for these kids to just hear each other and really understand each other so that they can have empathy for one another. Absolutely. I mean, that's excellent. Oh. All right, gang. Well, that's it for this evening. I appreciate each and every one of you. I just want to say in closing, we always have two options. We always have a choice. There are two choices in any given situation, in any, in any experience we can continue to react from our same old experiences and blueprints and past traumas and experience and operate out of fear, or in any given experience, we can choose love. We always have the choice. You have the choice. I hope you choose love. God bless you. Look forward to talking to you next month. And, Jeanette, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Brian. All right. Good night, everyone.